kind of testy, ain't you? Oh, well, I got no reason to be right. You know, Willie, I came down here to learn Robert Johnson's lost song, not to get slapped in the face by an old man or find out I got to become king of the hobos and go blow I'm sorry your life line. turned out so hard, Eugene, but I got my own business to tend to down here. And I don't mean for you to slow me down. Business? What business? Personal business. And given your attitude, you got no reason to know what. My attitude? What the hell's the matter with my attitude? I have a great attitude. You got your mind made up about how everything works, don't you? How are you ever going to learn anything new when you know everything already? Look at this old guitar you've been squeaking on. I bet you saw this thing in the music store and bought it just because you thought it was beat up. Well, you got it all wrong. Muddy Waters invented electricity. Somebody who thinks he's the toughest of nickel stage. But they all come to speed for the go Ray me. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers and we ain't friends. My little brother was 15 years old. Think about that. You'll wake up in hell. How about cutting hate? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boys. I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. Well, looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this is supposed to be your lucky night. And my body, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing, soldier. There's a place where deals are made and legends are born. And there was a kid. They called Lightning Boy. He was searching for the lost song. You could be the first man to record it. For a piece of fame and fortune. Like Clapton did with Crossroads. The Rolling Stones did it with Love and Vain. And he was looking to get him there. Welcome to Bluesville, son. This is the real thing. This ain't no book. Lightning Boy. And blind eye. What the hell are you guys supposed to be, huh? Both blues man. Yeah, well, I'm the blues man. He's from Long Island. All I need is a Mississippi string tie. I'm ready to roll. Yeah, you need a lot more than that. You know, the owner walked up to Willie, gave him three one hundred dollar bills, and says your boss can play. Only one blues man in town tonight. Who was me? Oh, I choke you. Well, you do, and you get knocked on your. There's a place where deals are made. And you made your deal at the crossroads. Yeah, I made the deal. Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boy, ain't you? Where a thin line separates the good. I'm giving you all the magic I've got from the great. Louis Brown sent me. Eugene Martone is ready to cross it. Hello, folks, and uh, welcome back after a long, long hiatus to Last Call of Torchies. I am one of your hosts, Gary Hill. With me, as usual, is Cameron Scott. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. I've been chomping at the bit, waiting to do this for a while now, so I'm excited. Excited. Nice, nice. And uh, with us from uh, the wilds of Canada, Mr. Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? Good. Uh, I'm glad you finally got that deal with the devil uh, sorted out in the crossroads so we can actually get this done. So that's good. I, I still can't carry a tune for shit, though, so, so, so there's that. And, uh, so I got the, I got the, I got the discount oh, deal. I, I got the... Can, uh, carry a tune. I bet you can carry a tune better than Ralph Macchio. <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get into that. We'll get into that sooner or later, right? <laughs> yeah. Rumor is he's born a poor black child. I, I don't know for sure if that's true or not, but... Uh... <laughs> no, that's the I'm wrong guy. Man. Yeah. I'm not a gambling man, but I, I, I'd bet money against that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe a poor Latino, uh, Latin, uh, Italian child, maybe, perhaps. Yeah, I can't, can't tell what he is. <laughs> uh, we're doing Crossroads uh, today, tonight. It, it is it is noon o'clock, where most of us are, <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, 
Which is appropriate. It's hot outside, so let's let's talk about the devil a little bit. Um, this is from 1986. This is directed by Walter Hill, written by John Fusco. Stars some some faces that you may know, um, including Ralph Macchio as Eugene Martone, aka Lightning Boy. Uh, Joe Seneca as Willie Brown. Oh, what was he had multiple names this film too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jamie Gertz, um, look, looking homeless but still sexy as Francis. Uh, Joe, Mor- Joe Morton as Scratch is number two. Uh, Robert, Robert Judd as Scratch. Steve Vai, the, the awesome Steve Vai, I should say, as Jack Butler. Uh, Harry Carey Jr., if you guys know what old school westerns, he shows up in this as the bartender. Um, so, some, some other names to mention. I, I, I'll, um, I'll get into it first with these guys. Uh, we'll start with Lee. Uh, first time watch. What's your experience with this one, sir? Yeah, uh, definitely first time watch. Um, I generally liked this. I was definitely surprised uh, how much I enjoyed it because just kind of the idea. I was like, okay, this might end up being like a whitewashed kind of look at blues or whatever. And it's like I'm not the biggest Ralph Macchio fan in the world. I I think he's like highly overrated, honestly, um, by just by just by nostalgia, uh, but he doesn't really have to carry the film necessarily. So I'm okay with that. He, he's got a great supporting cast here. Uh, I mean, you've got some just like interesting actors in here. Like Joe Seneca himself is just fucking great. Um, then you got like guys popping up like fucking Tim Russ. People would know as Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager these days more, more than anything else. Um, you got Alan Arbus who was in Putney Swope and Cisco Pike and Greaser's Palace and Coffee and, all kinds of interesting shit. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like this. It's It's got a good uh, blend of like blues folklore in it, sort of based on the Robert Johnson myth of, you know, going down to the crossroads. And uh, it sort of blends it with real life in a pretty seamless way. So obviously it, I think it has an appreciation for the music and the people who first, you know, created it and sort of the, the mythology that's kind of built up around it. And it's done in the form of a good, like, road trip movie, basically, which uh, I'm always game for because it's, it's just kind of a tried and true way to do a movie. And it's a little harder to fuck up. So, uh, yeah, this was, this was pretty good. Uh, we'll get into the details and stuff when we talk about it. But uh, I generally enjoyed myself on this one. Cool. Cameron. Uh, yeah, well, this wasn't the first time watched for me. I, I remember seeing it, you know. You know, back in the 80s <clears throat> when it you know first came out in 86 because I, I admit to being a bit of a Ralph Macchio fan like when Karate Kid came out but in retrospect uh, I don't think m- much of the Macchio yeah, I mean <laughs> really other than my cousin Vinny I can't say there's many of his movies that you know bear repeat viewings he's just kind of much like in this movie he's a bit of a weak link but the, as you said Lee you know he doesn't have to carry the movie the supporting characters help do that for him Yeah, and yeah. Joe Seneca is a case in point i mean from god from everything from the blob to to malcolm x to silverado you know he's, mm-hmm. he's been a kind of a run of everything and he's great uh you know i think there's uh a, a, this bigger story is not about you know Ralph macchio in this movie it's not about uh you know eugene it's about willie brown and it's all about you know his story go- and i would have much rather seen a, a whole story just about him and have the ralph macchio character be kind of whisked off to the side a little bit. yeah <laughs> you, you know uh, i was more enamored with uh willie brown than i was with anything and the music is great i mean mm-hmm. the steve Vai soundtrack is great the overall blues soundtrack is great having steve Vai pop up at the end is great i like this movie a lot more now as an adult than I did as a kid because as a kid I didn't like it. Now I, I kind of fell back in love with it, I think. Uh, so I, I got I to gotta thank you for doing the, sh- the show, Gary, because uh, you know a couple of these movies I, I may not have wanted to revisit. But, uh, but yeah, that, there's a whole lot to love about this movie. You got Joe Morton again. Robert Judd is great as Scratch, as old Scratch. Uh, Jamie Gertz, as much as her character is, gets kind of thrown away, it, uh, she's a breath of fresh air, you know. And, you know, I'm, I'm all good with some of my... my uh, you know, nostalgic uh, Lost Boys uh, star love. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I want to say I saw this first time um, as a kid uh, on, and on like Showtime or something. You usually, you know, when somebody had cable, they they record stuff for you. And we we had those videotapes where 
so we record stuff for us, and this was on one of those tapes, and I, 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 I remember watching it vaguely, but not really remember a whole, like, a whole lot about it, because it's not really, um, he's not really a kid, and he's not really a teenager, he, he seems kind of in between there, so, yeah. he, as, like, a nine-year-old kid, you can't really relate to Lightning Boy, so... <laughs> I didn't watch it till like much, much later to, to, to where, where I can actually appreciate, you know, what's going on in the movie. Um, the whole idea of uh, the crossroads demon uh, has been, you know, done tried and true, whether it be in mythology or in like uh, TV or in movies. It's a big deal in uh, the Supernatural series. They've done it once or twice on there. And this is, um, you know... They they've done it in many things. One of my favorite um, uses of it is in O oh Brother Art Thou, their their their, their black uh, 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 blind accompaniment, as they say, uh, claimed he he sold his his soul to play guitar real good. I'd, I'd imagine they were going for him being Robert Johnson in that movie, along with the other real real life uh, characters that they had in that movie. Um, this one though. Like Lee said, it's a, it's a great like road movie, and Machio is not much much to look at in this movie as far as as far as, far as it goes. He's not he's not the Karate Kid. He's not he's not um you know p- Pony Boy. He he's just this this guy. I mean he he's on the he's on the poster, but he's not the star of the movie. He's he's more like he's like the Jack Burton of the story, if you will. He's he's yeah. there to, to look at, but he's not doing a whole lot, you know super bland that's the problem like if, yeah. if they had cast like a river phoenix or a christian slater or heath or sutherland or something like that i feel like the whole tone of the movie would have been different i, I think sean penn would have been perfect in this could have worked too yeah in 80 86 sean penn yeah. would be uh, perfect i think um yeah, but it, it was just very uh very milk toast in this movie <laughs> he is he is he's, he's he's cocky for all the wrong reasons and he, he doesn't he doesn't know a whole, a whole lot about that world. He, he knows the classical guitar because, you know, don't get me wrong. They say he, he's he's going to Juilliard to be a musician. He's in the, when they show you the other person's fingers playing the guitar, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's he's quite good at it, you know. But um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's uh, Malt Macho's version of stunt cock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Need stunt hands, stunt hands. He stunt cocking all over this movie, and and I, I I got to meet Macho once or twice, and he also looks like he looks like he's seen slept about four days each time I ever, ever met him. But it is what it is. Uh, I asked him, you know, what was it like to work on this movie? He was like, they taught me how to fake play the guitar real good, and I was like, understood. <laughs> but um, yeah, his his parts. I think I think both parts were were, were played by um, especially in the duel. But by Steve Vai, except for like them, the real um, the, the slide parts. Those were Ry Cooter, who did the score for this film as well. So it was a com- it was a combination of both. So it was it wasn't Macho doing his thing. Uh, unfortunately, to to break anybody's spirits, just who thought so. It, it's it's not, guys. Um, Jamie Gertz was mentioned. She. she Plays a, a a a road a road twitch, if you will. I hate using that word, but I, I think it's maximum overdrive. Forgive me that fucking word. Mm. Uh, but she she is, is with them. I, I think her disappearance is just in the film, though, because she she's she's that person that's always on, that that's on the road, and she's just moving on in a way. And um, so and they, let's let's face it. I'm not buying that Ralph Macchio is going to be the guy who wins her off the road. And, no. Like, she turns her life around or whatever. Like, fuck that. Come it, on. And I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that 100% that, like, yeah, she's not into, you know, sticking around because that's that's not the way it is. And he's not really interested in, you know, hitting that, which would be really, really easy to go that way in an 80s movie. Oh, they're, they're going to be a thing, but they don't turn out to be a thing. They're just kind of protecting each other while, while they're together. Yeah. You know, when she's stealing wallets and, you know, seducing old men. <laughs> <laughs> They're just kind of covering each other's asses for the time being until you know something better comes along. Yeah. Uh, so did did I did I miss it? Was the bar in this Torchies or was it just a nondescript bar? Because I I was looking for a Torchies sign and I don't remember seeing it anywhere. I, I'd have to go back and look, but I think it was just like a nondescript bar. I think. Yeah, I had. It's going to be a running theme uh, in the two episodes we're recording tonight, where I have a big problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, yeah, uh, I did. I did want to uh, mention. Uh, so I, f- I forget his name. Who plays the devil here? He's fucking great. Uh, I, I just like I like the way that they try to keep this kind of grounded in reality in a way where you know uh, there's nothing necessarily overtly supernatural happening most of the time. And it, it gets a build up to finally meeting the devil, like quite a ways into the film. And he's just got the hugest, whitest goddamn set of teeth on him where he looks like he's got too many teeth. And it's one of the better depictions mm. of uh, Satan on on screen that I've ever seen. Like just uh, the presence that he that he holds and how effective he is. I, I just really, really loved it. And it's a shame that he passed away, you know, like right after this movie came out. Mm-hmm. It was such a great role. I mean, and I agree, I agree with you, Lee. He has, he has a very toothy grin, yeah. you know, and it's just like, like I said, almost like, like a shark's mouth. Like it's just too many teeth. Like he's going to bite you or something. Right. But yeah, he, he was definitely the highlight. He, f- he feels like, uh, he, he kind of feels like how Stephen mm-hmm. King would write the devil because mm-hmm. Stephen King has sort of written devil like characters and, it just kind of feels like it was almost like an adaptation of that kind of uh, uh, version of the devil that Stephen King would write about. You know, it's yeah, just it comes across a very Randall flag. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was just going to say the way that he wrote your know, Captain Trips there, you know, yep, yep. in the denim looking very plain and, you know, <clears throat> except, of course, when he changes and you, yeah. you don't get that in this movie. And I, I can appreciate that, too. You know, mm-hmm. that we and didn't I get like, uh, Joe. We didn't, we didn't get um but my my beer sweet brother Numsy moment golden child style in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> brother Numsy, uh, I do really like Joe Seneca in this, as we already sort of mentioned. Like when you when you kind of look at it, if you if you peel it back, it he's kind of uh this is almost like a sort of a timeless kind of hero's tale kind of thing where Joe Seneca is kind of like the old trickster wizard who you know beguiles the young the young hero. And, and scams him, and uh, I, I kind of like that, where, you know, he, he kind of uses his harmonica to beguile uh, people and, and get back to the crossroads to save his soul, and the whole film kind of plays out kind of like a quest in a way, you know, wizard, young apprentice, whatever, you know, kind of journey to deal with the devil. Um, it can be looked at it that way, so, like, it, it becomes a little bit of a piece of folklore while also sort of commenting on just sort of blues folklore, uh, African... Uh, American folklore. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's. It feels like there's a lot of little things that Walter Hill's trying to touch on here. It doesn't go, you know, too far in either direction with anything. But it just kind of neat little nuances of the film that uh, popped up that I appreciated. Yeah, I got to give some love to Joe Morton though because I, I, I always everything he's in, you know, Brother from Another Planet, this movie, even even Blues Brothers Two Thousand. Which I, I will, I will, I will, I will raise the flag for that film any day of the week because it has the greatest collection of musicians you're ever gonna find in in a movie and on a soundtrack, and he could sing in that movie well, you know. So so there's that. So if you ever want a reason to watch that movie, it's 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 Joe Morton uh, singing "Turn on Your Love Light" with the Blues Brothers Band. It's 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 pretty great. Nice. Um, yeah, the, the the whole the whole idea of him, you know really going on an empty quest to, to go try to redeem his soul. I mean, he, he, he had what he had. He didn't get what he what was all the way promised because it is the, the deal with the devil after all. But really going there with, with nothing. I, I don't know if he was tra- training the boy to to to, to uh, have a whole devil went down to Georgia situation that we get at the end of this movie or what's going on there. He, he wasn't going to trade him. I, I don't know. It just it it seems like a really empty quest, like a like the last request of a dying old man. L- literally, he he died. Yeah. You know, months after this movie was over. But um, um I, I, uh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, there is a different version of this movie. I, I I don't know if it was filmed, but it was one of the versions of the script where uh where uh, Willie Brown and ends up. Dying at the end. Like, he, he gets his soul back, but he dies, like, on the bus ride back or some shit like that. So, there there was, like, an alternate, like, downer version of this film. Yeah, but they went, they went with something about that. Went with the happier ending, they said. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, because like nobody would have accepted the fact that Willie died at the end. People, <laughs> well, people didn't really like flock to see this movie back in the day when it came out. You know, it became more of a cult hit. But I think people would have fucking rioted. If he yeah, killed old Willie. But I, I, I do like the idea that you know Hill was like sort of flirting around with the idea of making this darker. And like you could, you could have got even you know super darker, right? Like you could have, you could have had it. Like I do appreciate that, you know, uh, Joe Seneca's character. He's he's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of up in the air whether he can be trusted or not. Like every, it, it seems like he could throw uh, Machios to the wolves at any any turn, right? He's just using him for his own gains. Like if if you had like the super dark ending where he trades Ralph Machio's soul to get his back or something mm-hmm. like that. Like that that's an even like darker take material that I, I kinda wanna see. <laughs> yeah, I kinda wanna see that for <laughs> But then the devil realized Macho had no soul, so it was like ah <laughs> You will forever look tired and eventually have a comeback on a Netflix series. Yes, sir. <laughs> but it's not see, gonna be till you turn fifty five, so hold on a few years. See oh, that's boy. that's Machio's crossroads demon request right there that the Cobra Kai happened and you know the, yeah, the, he's got a He's got to suffer and, and see his uh, all the all the bad guys from his movies get bigger and more important roles in the series than him. <laughs> not that I'm a, not that I'm not a fan of the Cobra Kai series. I, I watch ten seasons of that. It's just you know it just seems seems like hey it's 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 really been an uprising of, of, of a film that never really went away. So be, rejoice, I guess. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, here we go. Eugene's Trick Bag, the updated classical piece, at the film's climax, is largely based on Niccolo Paganini's Caprice No. 5. Mm. According to myth, Paganini sold his soul to the devil for his musical skills. Steve Vai replicates Paganini's legendary rolling eyes, long unkempt hair, and gone to look. Yep. Yeah, Paganini, uh, he liked the fuck. And that got him a lot of bad press and a lot of... uh, a lot of people, you know, throwing shade on him like he obviously, you know, this guy, he plays like that and he's stealing all of our women and he's, you know, just drinking and doing whatever the fuck. He obviously made a deal. I mean, just like Jack Butler. I mean, he, he, Steve Vai is a good looking man in this movie, but he, he manages to give this troll-esque scowl and stature as he's playing this guitar mm-hmm. in a way to to make him look kind of ugly. And yeah. I, I, I can see all, all the all that shit now, you know. Especially when you see like uh like the, the stand in stunt cock hands as I continue to call them for Ralph Macchio. It it's just like a, a bad B movie when you watch it and you have stand in boobs and stunt boobs. Mm-hmm. It's just like that. It's obviously not from the same body of the actor in question here at yeah. all. So it's like so, not even close. Yeah. Oh, we're about to do a love scene. Let's not see the lead actress's face for two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> It's draped in shadow. Yeah. It's like that story that uh Cat Lester tells about taking taking her mother to go to um go see Phantasm for a screening and the the part where she's getting down in the cemetery, you see not her boobs. Her mother recognized it right away, those were not her boobs. <laughs> uh stu- stun cock, stun boobs, yada yada yada. Um <laughs> I got a question for you guys. The one bit of trivia that I had about this movie, and it just makes me wonder what you guys think it would, uh, how it would have changed the movie if C- Keith Richards was originally cho- the choice to play Jack Butler. How different do you think it would have been to have Keith Richards there, or would it, like would it have been any different? Um, man, I don't know. It's it might have worked. I, I don't like say say what you will about how kind of cool it is seeing him in those uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. It's not like he's doing much acting. Uh, I, I kind of feel right. like I kind of feel like this movie required a bit more seasoned like talent on screen than just you know pretending to be a drunken pirate. You know that that kind of. I do. Yeah, interesting for him to, see. to play a drunken pirate with a put on the outfit. Yeah, just to like <laughs> wear his normal clothes like that. That's basically what Keith Richards was doing in those films. But yeah, no, it, it might have. Uh, I mean, it'd have been different. I it's I I can't picture it. You know, like. Just certain casting like that is it's almost like, you know, Tom Selleck playing Indiana Jones. It's just like, I can picture it, but I just don't know that I agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll always have Chippendale's Rescue Rangers for that. It's okay, though, you know. <laughs> I'm uh, not ashamed to say that I like that movie. <laughs> uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> very dark, very dark. If you want to hear a good review of it, go uh, talk to my friends at the Deuce Podcast. Um, 
Brad and Jeremy, they did, yeah, they did a, a review of it, pretty pretty good review of it actually. Um, but yeah, Keith Richards, I don't know, the Stones, they never really went, they were still pretty relevant in the age, still, still really, ever, ever, really, really went away. It's just, um, I think Steve Vai was a pretty hot commodity, you know, in in '86, and it's, um, I think uh, it it belongs where it belongs. I, I mean, what do you even call it a time capsule? It's just he's good at what he does. For a very long time, you know. If they were doing a, I mean, also when I think about when I think about Keith Richards and I think about the way he plays guitar, I don't necessarily think about it in the sense of like technical precision that Steve Vai has, and I also don't really think of Keith Richards much as like a blues guitarist necessarily. Like he he, he definitely is more of a Chuck Berry guy than a. Then you know, like a Robert Johnson guy, I guess is the best way to put it. Well, that's that's um, that's probably where they were going with that because if you know the history of the Stones, you know their their early roots, yeah, you know, that that's where they they, they loved. That's the music they loved. So that's the music mm-hmm. that, that, that they they modeled their music after. So yeah, yeah, and I mean the the imagery is, I guess, apt. I mean they, especially during the seventies and coming out of the seventies, they they really had the the full like rock and roll excess uh, uh, sort of personas going on. Uh, so I guess it kind of fits. It just just feels like Keith Richards wouldn't have been up to snuff acting while doing that. So The fun thing about that um, that final battle is known as Eugene's Trick Bag. If, if you want to go find it, mm-hmm. fully transcribed, I guess, with shaped notes or whatnot, you have to find a certain uh, issue of Guitar World from 1987 to, to, to get that. So. Yeah. Some of them might have those 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 issues archived somewhere on the internet, somewhere scanned, and you know, so oh, most likely l- look for that, guys, if you want to. Uh, a scene that was supposed to be originally 15 minutes long, but it was edited down to two minutes to uh, heighten the impact of the scene, because you know, mm-hmm. it, it works. It works, guys. Trust me. If you haven't seen the film before, and it is it is a reason to get to the end of this movie, and. That's not even saying the movie's bad. It's just the the conclusion is is very satisfying because yeah. essentially he he does put up the kid's soul against Jack Butler in a duel, and uh, if the kid wins, you know it, it, he uh, he is free from his his uh, his satanly his satanly contract, if you will, and they they throw down and it's spectacular to watch Ralph Macho not playing the guitar and. Um, <laughs> I gotta reiterate it. Ralph Macchio does not play the guitar in this movie, <laughs> and the real Willie Willie Brown. Uh, the, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, and he deserved that mouth smack he got in the beginning. Yeah. Oh yeah. From Willie, <laughs> he popped him in the mouth. I'm like, pop him twice. Pop him twice. <laughs> yeah, give him another. Let's go mess with this elderly Southern black man that could possibly be a criminal and just keep on fucking with him. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably got a pistol in his. Out of his prison like cell. He's probably got a pistol on his bedside table. He's waiting for you, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, the real Willie Brown, uh, a.k.a. Mad Dog Fulton, that was his other name, uh, was a guitar player, not a harmonica player. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah. So they went for a real uh, a real Robert Johnson feel there, but just the opposite. Um, yeah. yeah. It, there, there's a lot to talk about in this movie, and I... I, I um, yeah, I don't. I don't want to get into too much more of this, but it, it's 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 a good time. It's it's it's, it's it, it lives up to the memory that, that 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 I had when I watched it as a teenager, not so much as a child. But I um I have a good time with it. I'll uh, kick it to Cameron, and ask him anything else I'd say about the film, and what would he give it? We don't we don't rate these. I forget. I'm stupid. Yeah. What, what, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like I said earlier, I like it a lot more now as an adult than I did as a kid. As a kid, I just you know, I was into music, but I wasn't that, like, refined in my taste. You know, I was just pretty much listening to pop type stuff, uh, admittedly. But uh, I like it a lot more now for what it is. And I'm willing to look past Ralph Macchio being such a fucking uh, a, a kind of a limp dick in this movie. <laughs> he's the weakest link. And uh, he's kind of an asshole here, much like the Karate Kid. He, he's just a... He's, you know, almost the villain of his own story, you know, it, which is really weird that that kind of got to be a motif with him. You know, he's his own worst enemy. Mm. Um, 
highlights Joe Seneca and Robert Judd as the MVP here. Whether they called him Legba or they called him Scratch, the names didn't matter. He was fucking slick as hell. So Robert Judd gets my MVP award. Uh, it, it's worth tuning in for the moment where they actually get to the crossroads. Mm-hmm. And you actually see that, you know, a Willie is willing to throw down and put, you know, the boys, uh, you know, soul up for, for grabs. And he he's, he's willing to take it to that level because you, you kind of like keep watching to keep hoping it's going to go the other way. It's like, God, oh, nah, he's not really going to do that, is he? Yeah, he does. that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got a great supporting cast. Again, like I said, Joe Seneca, Jamie Gertz, Robert Judd, uh, Joe Morton is great. Although I will debate that fact about Blues Brothers 2000 with you any day of the week, my dear friend. <laughs> I will admit, he can sing. He, he can sing, Gary, but man, that movie, whoo, whole hot mess. But I, just, I like just, could just go find the soundtrack. You'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just listen to the soundtrack. I just don't want to watch the movie ever again. But, uh, you know, I, I love the ending, which I call it High Stakes Dueling Banjos. Where it's like literally the devil went down to Georgia. And although the ending kind of ends abruptly... It ends the same way it begins. It, you know, begins them at the crossroads. So it's. I think the the way they ended it was right. Uh, I don't think the ending, the other proposed ending, the downbeat ending, would have would have played right. I just don't think it would have fit. So yeah, and uh, if we're not rating this, but I will definitely give it two thumbs up. Lee, uh, I liked it. I'm I'm not going to sit here and say it's my favorite Walter Hill film or anything like that. Uh, it, it does hurt it that Machio is kind of presented as the lead here and he's just white bread like everything else is like the condiments and the and the actual sandwich he, he's just <laughs> he's just on the edge there kind of holding it all together i guess but he's mayonnaise um, yeah he's mayonnaise <laughs> like and not the good kind like he's he's not hellman's or something he's just craft <laughs> craft miracle whip or some shit it's great um, value <laughs> yeah but yeah no this is, this is a lot of fun uh it, it is surprisingly uh good about you know getting into the actual blues mythology and stuff like that and treating it with respect. And it's got a good story as far as, you know, the road adventures and, and shit they have, you know, typical Walter Hill stuff, getting in bar fights and, 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 and shit like that, like all, all that kind of stuff that you come kind to of come to expect from Walter Hill, uh, even where he's yet again doing a movie that's otherwise kind of out of his wheelhouse in a lot of ways where it doesn't feel like, his stuff that's come before necessarily. So yet again, Walter Hill is doing something different and, but still has his sort of Walter Hillish touches all over everything. Um, yeah. I like, it's, it's kind of like middle of the pack for me out of the stuff we've done so far. I think it's worth a watch. Um, I don't know if it holds too much rewatch value for me other than maybe watching the clip of the crossroads uh, meetup uh, on YouTube or something like that. Cause that's really effective stuff. And uh, yeah. Good stuff. I liked it. Yeah, something Lee mentioned earlier about, you know, this could have really easily went that way of being a mid-80s, you know, film about a white kid, you know, go on the road with the, with the wise Negro, you know, idea. And it really doesn't go there. It, it, this, this guy has got nothing to lose. So he, he has time, but he ain't got time for this curious white boy. So I'm glad that it didn't go that way because a lot of films like that could go that way. And like a, yeah, like a Huck Finn type story. I'm not going to use the word they use in that book, but you know, that guy's name was Jim, but they used another word before it. But um, yeah. I, I love the no nonsense you know, view of, of Joe Seneca in this movie, uh, Willie Brown. And it really helps propel the story and really helps it not go that other way. And I, I, I can appreciate so many things about this film, and like like Lee says, it's not, it's not my favorite um, of the Walter Hill stuff by by far. I mean, we talked about a lot of my favorites already, and, and it, this this is um this is there for nostalgia. This is there for you know watching a good story. If you want it on a Blu-ray, you can get it for like nine dollars right now on one of those Mill Creek um, mm. retro uh, cases, you know. Um, so it's not a big expense if you want you own this. Um, but good shit, good times. Um, that's it. That's it for this one. We ain't talked in a while, so I'll uh, I'll kick it to Lee first and tell us where else you could find them. Uh, yeah, you can find me at tmbdos.podbean.com. That's, that's they must be destroyed on site uh, podcast, and uh, you can see all the stuff we're up to there. Um, we've been doing a lot of different stuff, you know, bouncing around lately. Uh, a lot of, a lot of it's circling around like Paul Bartel, Mary Warnoff, Divine, John Waters, that sort of thing. We've been kind of 
bouncing back and forth between some of their interconnected uh, movies and, and whatnot. Uh, latest episode, uh, probably about around the time you're hearing this, is uh, Sugar Cookies. The, uh, Mary Warnoff, Lynn Lowry, lesbian, uh, erotic thriller type movie from the 70s that uh, Lloyd Kaufman was partly responsible for and Oliver Stone had a producing credit on, but he doesn't talk about it. <laughs> you ask him and he'll deny it. Um, yeah. Check that out. Cool. Cameron. Oh, well, I just came back from a film shoot in, uh, in, in Florida, cool summer part two. So it's going to be looking for a trailer for that coming out here very soon. Uh, I'm back at it on cinema degeneration. I just released another howling at the full moon episode where we did shrunken heads, uh, mm-hmm. Richard Altman joint. Uh, Love shrunken it, heads. Oh uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a classic. Man. That, that's classic Paramount era stuff right there. And uh, I'm doing a pretty big movie uh, for sequel to Deja Vu. We're tackling uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two next, Ooh. and got a couple other things uh, in the works, but uh, nothing definite right now. Working on the next Appreciation Month, which won't come out until uh, October. I already talked to you gents about that, but um, we'll be recording those coming up here soon. But, yeah, you can find all my stuff at Cinema Degeneration pretty much on every platform where you can get podcasts. Cool. Yeah, stuff coming for me. Um, once I get Ricky, Ricky's uh, busy with his band all summer long on the weekend, so I'm going to hit him up after the 4th of July. This is the 3rd of July recording uh, today about recording the last segment for the third part of the Beaverversary, third and final part. And um, we covered the, the Christopher Guest films in, in that mix, and... Me and Ricky have been doing crippled theater to, to, to throw something a little, a little extra taste for you guys on there. Um, final review for that should be Wired to Kill, which is um, a film about <clears throat> like street toughs. It, it's kind of like a Mad Max situation, but in suburbia, and they break this kid's legs and I think kill or rape the mother. I forget how it goes, but it, anyway, he, he builds robots to to com- combat these these street gangs that include. Uh, Merritt Buttrick, who was on Square Pegs, and he played uh, Captain Kirk's son on Star Trek, uh, in the second Star Trek film and third one. Um, it also stars a young Tiny Zeus Lister in that movie as well as one of the as one of the toughs. It's it's I watched it uh, long ago for the show, and if you can go to YouTube and find the only good copy that exists, it says Lightning Video on the front of it. Um, go watch Wired to Kill if you want to keep up with this. It's it's. It's my kind of stupid. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> um, besides that, two minimum commentaries coming back um, with the return of Tiny O. D- Tiny O. And if you listen to uh, <laughs> the first Gore episode, <clears throat> there's a, a, a little person actor who, who we dubbed Tiny ti- Owen. I need Tiny O in my in my life. We need more. We, we need more Tiny O in our life. A little person actor that resembles oh, uh, the late Owen Hart and. So he's been dubbed Tiny Owen and kind of has become the mascot of the show. So we need more Tiny Owen in our life. So, <laughs> But uh, Outlaw of Gore should be coming out very soon. Next one I believe we're doing past that is The Visitor we're doing next. So mm-hmm. look for that. Uh, summer Summertime stuff from the beef. I have plans, but nothing, nothing really is uh, gelling right now. So it might be surprises for you guys, including possible... Summary fair, you know, horse, horror stuff, drama stuff, comedy stuff, you know, all sp- takes place in the summer. And if I get some folks together to do those, um, it, it could be a good time. Just, uh, just a little one-off stuff. Um, besides other stuff is coming, gears are churning or whatever. Duncan McLeish podcast under the stairs summer series that's coming with me by my last year doing that. I just it's it's not him. It's it's my own demons, guys. <laughs> Put it that way. You know? Yeah. It always seems when it comes up, I'm always terribly behind on things, and it's not him. It's me. It, it, it's it's just me. Um, yeah, I, I had to I had to drop out this year because it was just I, I just had too much going on. So. It's it's a big commitment. It is. Yeah, it is. Um. Besides that, I'm supposed to come back on with the the the, the Lee and the Lady Lee uh, mm-hmm. eventually. I was actually going to talk about you to you about that right after the show. That's cool. We'll talk about it after the show. Um, do a pretty pretty cool flick, I, I think. Um, besides that, this has been Last Call of Torchies. We'll see you next time for for uh, something very fun that says it's extreme prejudice, right, Lee? Uh, 
I think it is. I think it is. And uh, that, that'll be next in the Lee's Patreon choice, which we'll mention on the Patreon episode. I'm sure Lee has, may, may, have, may or may not have something picked, picked out for this. Uh, we'll, I don't have anything yet. Maybe okay, <laughs> fair enough. But um, this has been Last Call of Torches, like I mentioned, and we'll uh, see you guys all again next time. Later. Later.